Our sermon today, we're back in the book of Daniel. We're continuing the series. We're moving forward. We're in the book of Daniel. And I can't help but think, based on the children's story that Linda shared with us today, about the little boy Henry, about the story of another Henry. The United States of America would probably be a completely different place if Henry Heth wouldn't have set J. Johnson Pettigrew out to look for shoes one late June day in, or one late June day in 1863. You see, Henry Heth was a division commander in the Confederate Army. Pettigrew was one of his best generals. And they were both in rural Pennsylvania. In fact, just a few miles from a little town called Gettysburg. The South was winning the Civil War and easily... They were planning on just laying low for a few months, waiting out the rest of the summer, and then they were going to put out a full frontal attack on the north, something that had never been done, at least not in a few years, catch them off guard, and they would crush the north in the fall. That was their goal. Heth's men were running low on supplies. They figured they'd restock. And they went to nearby Gettysburg. They heard that it had a small collection of supplies, including shoes, which they always needed. But when Pettigrew was there, he spotted a Union force arriving from the south, looking exhausted. He ran back to his, to his commander. He told him what he'd seen. And even though he had been ordered to wait until the entire army could gather itself for that fall campaign, Heth decided to swing into Gettysburg and just take care of that little Union force by himself. And in the process, he set off one of the bloodiest wars in American history. As we continue to study through the book of Daniel, I think of a lot of the same things happening as we continue into Daniel chapters 8 and 9 today. We're in Daniel chapters 8 and 9, and you'll see it here. We've changed languages again. Refresh your memories. Daniel chapter 2, we changed languages from Hebrew to the more universal Aramaic. Why do you change languages? You're speaking to a different audience. And so at this point now, we've changed languages and we've gone back. We're back in Hebrew. Daniel is once again speaking to the people in the church, speaking to God's people. And so what we're going to look at today in Daniel chapters 8 and 9 is a message that God has for his people. I want you to discover it with me as we study the galactic Gettysburg. Daniel chapters 8 and 9. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we open your word today, speak to us. Help us to see Jesus. Help us to draw closer to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So if you've got your Bibles, I want you to open your Bibles to the Gospel according to Daniel chapter 8. You know that I'm going to put it on the screen, but I want, to have, I want you to have it in front of you. Because I'm not going to be working phrase by phrase like I normally do. I have a bit of a confession to make. This is a hard sermon for me to write, simply because in this past year, I've already taken two classes on the book of Daniel. I've spent more than five months studying the book of Daniel. And it's not that I had a problem writing a message that was, I had a problems coming up with something to say. I've had a problem with too much to say. Andrew and I have to be ready to leave for Lyft for tomorrow, and so I do want to just jump to highlights. If you have specific questions that you've run across through Daniel 8 and 9, I'd like to say I'd schedule an appointment with you, call my secretary, but she's leaving, and so we can't do that, but we'll work out something. If you have questions about anything that you see in Daniel chapters 8 and 9, I'd love to talk to you, but I want to show you highlights from the book of Daniel. So if you've opened your Bibles to Daniel chapter 8, say amen. If you need just another second, say hallelujah. I'll give you another second. And it's quiet. So what we're going to do, we're going to jump not into verse 1, although you know I love to look at the, the years and, and the places. I want to talk about all of that, but I don't have time. We're jumping right into the meat of the vision. This is Daniel chapter 8, starting at verse 3. I lifted my eyes and saw, and there standing beside the river was a ram which had two horns. And two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the other one came up last. And I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward, so that no animal could withstand him. Question for you, if he pushes west and north and south, what direction hasn't been mentioned? East. So he probably came from the east. We will probably be able to use this to identify who this ram is from the fact that he came from the east. 
uh, still in verse 4, um, no animal could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver from his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. This is our first reference to the word great. You're going to see it. I've got it underlined on the, on the screen. But in the next couple of verses, the word great becomes important. So the first thing we see is a ram, and it becomes great. And as I was continuing, or considering, verse 5, as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west. Came from where? Came from the west. Across the surface of the whole ground without touching the ground. Sounds pretty fast. The goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And he came to that ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing beside the river. And he ran at him with furious power. And I saw him confronting the ram. He was moved with rage against him, attacked the ram, and broke his two horns. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled on him. And there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. That almost sounds like what we'd heard about the ram, that no animal could deliver, and now we hear here that the goat, no one could stop him from using the ram as his own personal trampoline. I do want to show you, uh, there, there is one little pun that Daniel did put in here. Uh, in verse 5, it said that the ram is moving so fast, he didn't do what to the ground? He didn't touch the ground. I'll let you know that Hebrew word for touch actually appears again, sort of a pun. It's later on, it's in verse 7. The same word that or the ram didn't, or the goat didn't touch the ground, he did touch the, go, or the ram in a very significant way. The same word there is done in verse 7, that he attacked the ram. It's the same word. So you, you kind of catch it. He's moving so fast, he doesn't touch the ground, but he made sure to put a special touch on the ram. And of course, down at the bottom, verse 8, therefore the male goat became very great. Do you catch the pattern so far? First, we see an introduction to the animal, or the symbol. It has a direction, it moves in a direction, and then it becomes great, or in this case, very great. Progressive. Great. Very great. And we continue. But when he had become strong, the large horn was broken, and in the place of it, four notable ones came up toward the winds of heaven. There's a direction. And out of one of them came a little horn, which grew not great, not very great, but exceedingly great toward the south, towards the east, and towards the glorious land. And it grew up toward the host of heaven, and it cast the earth... Uh, I've got it up here on the screen. Grew up towards the host of heaven, cast some of the stars to the ground, and trampled them, a lot like what the goat had just done to the ram. It's a pretty intense vision, wouldn't you say? Quick, to the point, kind of violent. But did you notice the, di the direction change? The ram was headed in one direction. The goat was headed in another direction. They all did some stuff around the earth. And they, in this case, we interpret it as they moved around Israel or the, the Mesopotamian area. But at one point, when the little horn comes up, he does some work initially. In what does it say in verse 9? The south and the east. And then towards the glorious land. And then it went you see at some point here, this little horn power has changed from attacking not only the peoples of the earth and attacking the other world empires, but it decides that it wants to make an attack on heaven and God's people. This becomes important, and I'll show you later on how. And so we have this little horn. He exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. And by him, the daily sacrifices were taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Everything that's said about the little horn reminds me of something. I don't know if it's, it stands out to you, but when I hear what's said about the little horn, this attack on the host, this attack on heaven, this attack on the prince of the host, it sounds like something that happened in the beginning. Did you recognize it? Do you hear the, the almost same description of the great controversy going on? What's the great controversy? There's been an age-long war in heaven. At some point, the devil, the, sa the Satan, Satan means adversary, the devil, decided that he didn't like what God was up to. 
He didn't like God's structure. He didn't like God's government. He didn't like God's character. He thought he could do it better. And so the devil rebelled. He turned his back on God, and he started this great cosmic civil war, which we are now a part of. You still see it today? Do we still see traces of the fact that the devil is trying his best to discourage God and God's people, to try to interfere with God's plans from coming through? Do we see that today? We do. We see here that this little horn actually becomes an agent in a specific era of Earth's history. It becomes an agent of the devil as a part of this cosmic conflict. And then all of a sudden, while this is all going on, Daniel hears something. Down in verse 13, I heard a holy one speaking. Another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, How long will the vision be? How long will everything that I've just seen be concerning the daily sacrifices, the transgression of desolation, the giving of the sanctuary, and the host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, wait, 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 he said to who? This is a conversation, this is an A and B conversation. One angel's talking to another angel, but the second angel doesn't answer the first angel. He turns and talks to Daniel. For 2,300 days, and the sanctuary shall be cleansed. We know the pattern. We've seen it so far twice in the book of Daniel. Chapter 2, we have a vision. We have symbols. The, ob or the vision moves forward, and then at the end, there's an interpretation. So in Daniel chapter 2, we saw the image, that, uh, that idol. In chapter 7, we saw more images. We saw beasts. We saw monsters. We saw the little horn. But God gave the interpretation. And so, keep reading you'll see one of the most... I, I, I had never seen this before. Verse 15. It happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision, was speaking the meaning, the, or seeking the meaning, suddenly there appeared before me one having the appearance of a man. I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, that's the river where he is, and he called and he said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. Pause for a second. Who is this to give Gabriel instructions? Who in the universe has the right to push Gabriel around and tell him, go do this or go do that? I can name about three beings in this entire universe that can, that can give an order to Gabriel, and they're all God. So I think we're listening to divinity here, possibly even the pre-incarnate Jesus. And so when he came near to where I, where I stood, he came, I fell afraid, I fell on my face. Understand, it's a big word. I want you to pay attention to this word. Understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. And so we jump down. I want to jump all the way down to the interpretation itself, starting at verse 20. The ram which you saw. We hadn't seen anything like this in, verse, in chapter 2. We haven't seen anything like this in chapter 7. Here we go. The ram which you saw, having two horns, they are the kings of who? Median Persia. Some of you have been dying for me to finally say Median Persia, and here we go. The ram is Median Persia. The male goat is the kingdom of? Greece. Kingdom of Greece. The large horn is between the eyes, is the first king. We don't have a name for that king yet, but what is the name of that king? Alexander, Alexander the Great. It's not given anywhere else in the rest of the book, so we'll go ahead and fill in the rest of the blanks for you through history. I actually went ahead and put up a chart for you, so you can see it up here. We'll kind of follow along. Point by point, you'll see all of the parallels. You'll see Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, and then you see this little horn. And a little controversial, but I want you to understand what I'm doing here. Is that the fourth empire, the way that Daniel 8 describes it, the little horn initially starts off on a horizontal level and turns vertical, right? There is no pause between the goat and the four horns and then this little horn. And so the way that Daniel 8 seems to describe it is it doesn't do a strong, there is no strong division between the pagan empire of Rome and the church of Rome initially. 
Initially, this is a pagan political empire, which turns to have religious aspects later on. And what is the name of the, of the aspect of the Roman Empire which takes on religious aspects? What is the name of the Roman Church? This is the Catholic Church. Now, I'm going to tell you, I don't have a problem with individual Catholics. There are godly individual Catholics, as I look around. There are godly individual Mormons. There are godly individual Jehovah's Witnesses. I was brought to meet Andrea in the first place because I met a, a Muslim who was open to doing God's will. But just because there are individuals who can do things right and wrong in a certain institution, does that mean that, they're, that the institution itself is immune from flaw? For example, whichever side of the, the political aisle you sit on, if you're a Republican, can you at least admit that there are good Democrats? And if you're a Democrat, can't you at least admit that there are good Republicans? You can admit that there, there are good people that may be in flawed systems. Would you agree? And so when I stand up here and I tell you that I believe that this little horn which comes out, which initially is a part of that, that last beast empire, the, out of the Roman Empire, which ends up becoming religious in its focus, that Catholic Empire, I'm calling out the Catholic Church for the blasphemies that it, that it has systematically made against God. But I mean no offense to individual Catholics. But I've got to call it like I see it in the Word. So you see it, it's up on the screen. I can explain it to you further if you want to see it. But we're going forward. There's some better descriptions. Daniel jumps all the way down. There's some, for some reason, my, my Prezi is messing up. Uh, this isn't AV people fault, this is Pastor Taylor fault. So uh, don't, don't say anything to them. Jumping all the way down to the end. Verse 27, I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. Afterward, I arose and went about the king's business. I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. Pause for a second. Let me ask you a question. Daniel says no one understood it. It means he went around and he explained everything that he'd seen. Chapter 2, chapter 7, chapter 8. He's explained everything that he's seen. And he says no one understood it. I actually made a little chart for you here. In the book of Daniel, chapter 8, I see a couple of portions of the prophecy. The first portion of the prophecy that we saw, what was the first thing that we saw? The first thing we saw, the animal was a, was a ram. Was the ram explained? Yes. The next object was a goat. Was the goat explained? Yes. The next thing was the goat horns. Were the goat horns explained? Yes, we don't have names for them, but we understand what's going on. The next thing we see is, of course, the little horn. Has the little horn been explained thoroughly? It's been chapter 7, it's in chapter 8. It's been thoroughly explained. All that's left is one little thing. And what is that little thing that hasn't been explained? 2,300 days in chapter 8, verses 13 and 14. And so this is what Daniel has to have on his mind. 2,300 days. What's the big deal about 2,300 days? 2,300 days works out to just over six years, if we take it in literal time. Have we had anything to really worry about in the past six years? I mean, as much as we've seen the, the economy of the United States and the political system of the United States go some ups and downs, we see the state of the world kind of in flux a little bit. Do we really expect that the entire scope of everything else, remember, how long will the whole vision be? Do you think that really could span just a little over six years? The rise and fall of the Medes and the Persians, the rise and the fall of the Greeks and their kings, and then the rise and the fall and the desecration of the Roman Empire? That couldn't possibly be 2,300 literal days, could it? Daniel knows this. He knows this clearly. And so what's left other than to pray? So that's what we have. You know that originally in the Bible there were no verse divisions, there originally were no chapter divisions, that when Daniel was writing with his pen on the, on the papyrus or the parchment, whatever he used to write originally, as he's writing the story, he, he went straight from chapter 8 into chapter 9. And so he's astonished by the vision, he didn't understand it, 
And chapter 9 begins. Fifteen years have passed, and Daniel is still of one mind. In Daniel 9, starting in verse 1, there's still one thing on his mind. In the first year of Darius, the son of Azurius, in the lineage of the Medes, we're now after the fall of Babylon, we're in the Median Empire, who was made the king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books of the numbers of the years, specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Israel, or of uh, Jerusalem, I'm sorry. What's the problem here? God has given Jeremiah a prophecy that all of this captivity, everything you people are going to go through is going to last 70 years, and then you're going home. And then all of a sudden, here we go. God tells him about 2,300 days. What's the problem? We've already realized that Daniel, and this is the problem, Daniel realized that this could not have been a literal 2,300 days. He realized that, for example, in the, in, in the Old Testament, the original stories of, of the Exodus, that a day can equal a year. Sometimes, occasionally, it's not an absolute mandate. But what he's realized here, both from the writings in the book of Numbers and even from his own contemporary, somebody who was also in the exile with him, a prophet named Ezekiel. Did you know Ezekiel was, uh, lived at the same time as Daniel? Ezekiel had to deal with one set of punishments from God where God made him lay on his side for days and days, a day for a year. And so now all of a sudden Daniel's realized, wait a second, God... Wait, wait, wait. Are you taking those 70 years that you'd originally said and for some reason making 70 years, 2,300 years? Is that what you're going to do here, God? What could the people have possibly done? What, what sent them into captivity in the first place? Why did the people have to go into captivity in the first place? Solana, did the, Babylon, or did the uh, Babylonians come to Judah because they were nice, friendly people that, and Judah was following everything God said to do? No. Uh, um, James, do you think that, that the people of Israel use this as an opportunity? God said, I'm going to take you as my special people. I'm going to put a special little bubble around you because I love you so much. And I'm going to send you to Babylon. And you're going to be my witnesses. And, and you're going to have like high grade authority. Do you think that that's what God was doing with them? Because they were lovely people and doing everything he said? No. The problem is that the people had gone into captivity because of their sins. They had listened to God in one ear and out the other. They had heard what God had called them to do, and they ignored him time and time again. The nation of Israel was destroyed in the 8th century, and this was supposed to be a warning to the people of Judah and the city of Jerusalem. They had a hundred years of opportunity to reflect on what God had done to punish, to get the attention of his people. And now here they are. You follow the chronology, we're talking approximately 65 years in. Do you think the people really learned their lessons? Do you think that God's people were really faithful in Babylon at all times? If God's people were really faithful in Babylon, why was it that only three Hebrews were thrown into the fiery furnace and not multitudes of them? If God's people were really faithful those just 65 years in Babylon, why was there only one that was busted for praying? God's people had sinned time and time again, had fallen short of the glory of God time and time again. And so this prayer, beautiful prayer, chapter 9, starting at verse 4, goes all the way down. It's one of the longest prayers recorded in the narratives of Scripture. It goes all the way down to the end of verse 19. I went through and I counted in this, in this big prayer from verses 4 to 19. How many times do you think Daniel confesses the sins of his people. Just take a guess. Fifteen verses, how many confessions, how many times does he say we've sinned? Five. That's the same guess Andrea came up with when I asked her. Okay, numbers five. How many think less than five? Anybody think he confessed less than five? How many think more than five? Lots of hands going up. The correct answer? Twenty-four. Twenty-four times. This is the topic that's on his mind. It's what he's been praying about for 15 years now. 
We have blown it, God. We've sinned. You go through it. I mean, how many times does he say we've sinned? We've heard, we've heard what you said and we've ignored you. Turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. How many times does he mention iniquity and sin and falling? But what's beautiful about this, what's beautiful is that's not the only thing he's praying for. Because we all can acknowledge our sinful state. Amen? When we look at, for example, the investigative judgments, is the investigative judgment to reveal that we're sinners? Do we really need to get the whole universe together to point out the fact that Mike's a sinner and, and that Patrick's a sinner and, and, and that Alberta's a sinner? Do we really need to get the whole universe together to point that out? I think it's pretty clear that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So that's not what he's praying about here by itself. Because he does make requests for mercy. In 15 verses... Daniel makes 14 specific requests for God's mercy, for grace, for forgiveness, because he knows that he is a God, that we serve a God, that if you have sinned, you have the opportunity to ask for forgiveness, and he will give it to you. That's just the God that we serve. You have to mean it, of course. You can't just be like when I've seen on the playground with some of these kindergartners, Mrs. Adams, you know what I'm talking about, but there have to be, that there is the opportunity, it's beautiful, that if we've sinned, we can ask God for forgiveness. But what Daniel is worried about, what Daniel's actually afraid of at this point, and you see it in his tone down in verse 19. Oh Lord, hear. Oh Lord, forgive. Oh Lord, listen and act. Do not delay. Delay what? What are you saying? Don't delay the restoration of the kingdom. Don't delay. Don't turn those 70 years into 2,300 years, God. Don't delay for your sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. Please, God, forgive us. I love this. Now, while I was speaking, while I was praying, while I was confessing my sins, while I was speaking, in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I'd seen in the vision at the beginning. In the vision at the beginning, he hasn't seen him in any vision in this chapter. What vision did he see Gabriel in before? The one that's still on his mind, the one he can't stop talking about. The last chapter, the one with the ram and the goat and the little horn and now the 2300 days. Huh. Gabriel, who I'd seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly reached me at about the time of the evening offering. I'll let you know that this chapter, chapters 8 and 9, so much uh, symbolism and so many references to the Old Testament Day of Atonement, I'd have to preach a whole other sermon to explain them all to you. Leviticus chapter 16, the Day of Atonement, the sacrifices, do you realize that in the entire sacrificial system, that a ram and the goat were only used one time together, and that was at the Day of Atonement? Re read it through, Leviticus chapter 16. If I were to tell you that I saw a vision of a bunch of turkey running around together, and it was a holiday, what holiday would I probably be thinking of? And if I saw a bunch of reindeer gathered together, and a big, jolly, happy man, he doesn't even have to have the red suit on, I'd still probably be thinking of Christmas. And so when Daniel sees a vision of a ram and a goat, he already gets the idea that this is talking about judgment, that this is talking about the Day of Atonement. The time of the evening offering, verse 22. And he informed me, talked with me, and said, O Daniel, I have come forth now to give you the skill to understand. Remember that word? At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out. The beginning of his supplications. Wait a second. So you mean it doesn't matter that whole beautiful prayer I just told you about? Gabriel didn't hear a word of it because God had already sent, been, had sent him to answer it? You mean that God already knew what's on our hearts? He knew what we were wrestling with? He knew what Daniel had been praying for for the past 15 years? And he waited until just this day to give him an answer? It's a lesson, isn't it? To think that you could pray about something repeatedly, day in, day out. And it's an important something, isn't it? can pray for 15 years and then just out of the blue God says that's it the minute you open your mouth I'm gonna answer that prayer I just have to trust in his timing 
Because as we've seen here time and time again, he's in charge of time. He's in charge of the flow of history. From the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I've come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Which vision? The only thing that he hasn't understood at this point, when, when we talk about uh, the, the command to understand, what is the only thing he doesn't understand? The 2300 days. And so how does, how does Gabriel help him understand the 2300 days? Does he, he sit down and, and show him how a day equals a year, and, and that it had to start at a specific year, and it had to go to another year? And what is, so it started when and, and ended when? I'll show you. Is that what he did? Seventy weeks are determined. This is how you understand 2300 days. Seventy weeks are determined. The word determined in Hebrew is the idea of you take a, a length of rope, or if I were to take like a length of this AV cable, and the word is actually the idea of cut off from something larger. So if I were to take this whole like 10 feet of AV cable, or I, I don't think they'd like that, I'd take 10 feet of yarn. I'd take 10 feet of yarn, and I were to cut off a smaller portion of it. That is the exact same Hebrew word that's used there. And so when we see that 70 weeks are determined, Daniel already knows, wait a second, these 70 weeks have to come from the 2300, because that's what Gabriel is telling me here. 70 weeks are determined for your people, for your holy city, to, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, all those things you've been praying for, all, the, all of that's going to end at the end of 70 weeks, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, to anoint the most holy. And therefore, know and understand, that word again, that from the, com from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince... There shall be seven weeks, 62 weeks. The street will be built again, and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end of it shall be with a flood, until the end of the war of desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of that week... He will bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And in the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the cons consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Four crazy verses. There's a lot of big words in there. There's a lot of concepts going on in there. I want to simplify it for you. I'm just going to boil it down to one little chart that I want to show you here. Basically put, there are 70 weeks. We've got it up here. There are 70 weeks. From the command to go to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. That command was given in 457 B.C. We've got that in Ezra chapter 7. Seven weeks and 62 weeks equals 69 weeks. If a day equals a year, seven days in a week, we're talking about 483 years. If you go from 457 B.C., it takes you all the way to 27 A.D. You've got to cut out the zero because there was no zero. What happened in 27 AD? What happened in 27 AD? Christ was baptized. I've heard a few of you mentioning it. We're going to talk about this some more in my series that I have coming up when we talk about the book of Luke, because Luke actually gives us that specific year. So at the end of these 483 years, we have one last week. That starts in 27, and it ends in 34, and right smack in the middle. The most important point, the thing that ties all other prophecies together, is what happens to the Messiah when he dies for the sins of his people. Isn't that what Daniel was praying about? Forgive us, God. We need your mercy, God. We've sinned and we've blown it, God. That was one of the things he was praying for in all of chapter 9. And we see it here. 20, uh, halfway between 27 and 34, approximately 30 or 31 AD, you follow the chronology of the Gospels. It's when Jesus was crucified. The Messiah was cut off. And so we take those 
70 weeks, those 490 years. And we are able to cut off 490, and what's left is 1810. You take 1810, you add it to 34, and you end up in 1844 AD. And we can talk about the Day of Atonement, the type and anti-type. We can talk about the fact that uh, Jesus Christ is up there making atonement for and, and cleansing the sanctuary, and for all of my sins and all of your sins, he's making things right, and there's this investigative judgment. I can talk about all of those things. But the most important thing that I want you to notice is that central to all other prophecies, central to all other teachings, the most important thing in the book of Daniel to understanding everything else that's going on, the central word on understand is the death of the Messiah. It is the death of the Messiah on the cross for my sins, for your sins, for Daniel's sins, for his people's sins, for everyone's sins. It's that death that makes everything else possible. Jesus couldn't cleanse the sanctuary with his blood if he hadn't shed his blood. The central point of this galactic Gettysburg is the death of the Messiah. I'm going to talk more Next time I get up here, I'm going to be preaching a communion service on November 3rd. I want you to be here. It's just over a month from now. I'm going to take a look in depth at what Jesus did from the book of Daniel. I'm going to show you how this all ties together. But I, before we jump into that, I just want to remind you that the central point of all that God is trying to teach us, of that word understand, which appears seven times in the book of Daniel, verses eight, or chapters 8 and 9, seven times we see the reminder to understand and the only thing that we understand at this point is that Jesus Christ died on a cross for us exactly when God told him he would almost 500 years ahead of time. This is something that God has been planning according to the book of John. He is the lamb slain from the foundations of the earth. From the minute and even before that we've sinned, there was already a plan in place to, for Jesus to die for the forgiveness for his people. And so if we carry that into all of history, and we carry it through all of the prophecies, and we look at the idols and the beasts and the little horn, and we look at all of those things, we can look at the investigative judgment, we can talk about 1844, but none of that matters if it's not for Jesus Christ and the fact that he died on the cross for our sins. Amen. I've actually seen William Miller's preaching Bible. You know that William Miller's preaching Bible? You've heard of William Miller. He was the great preacher in the 19th century, starting in the early 1800s, who recognized that something significant was going to happen in 1844. If you go to Andrews University, into the basement of the James White Library, we have what's called the Center for Adventist Research. And in there, we have all sorts of amazing um, artifacts from history. And one of the things they have is James White, or is William Miller's preaching Bible. This is the one he took with him everywhere. And they showed you, they showed us, it was cool. You open up his Bible, you had to put gloves on. We couldn't even touch it, it was uh, one of the, the tour guides. You open it up, and you notice you use a Bible enough, it starts to get oil and dirt and stuff on it. You go to Daniel chapter 8, and you'll see down in here, when he's preaching, from how he holds the Bible, it's almost black from the oils of his skin, because he preached on Daniel chapter 8 so much. I ask the question, are there any other sections of the Bible that look like that in his Bible? He says, as a matter of fact, there are. What's amazing is all of the Gospels, every single page looks like that. Every single page has black from how much he held it open in his fingers as he preached from it, as he sweat and transferred the oils. We can preach a message of 1844, of Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, like William Miller did. But in order to do that, like William Miller did, we should probably be able to preach the Gospels, to preach Jesus Christ, what he did in his life, and what he did in his death, the way William Miller did. It was essential to his ministry, to sharing with people the good news of Daniel. More importantly, it's essential to him to show them the good news of Jesus Christ from the Gospels. I'm going to close by going back to that Pennsylvania battlefield 
1863. The Battle of Gettysburg had, may have started over shoes and had been incredibly ill-advised, but the South still nearly won because they had the surrounding area surrounded. They had the Union troops quickly captured in most of the strategic spots except for a few hills in the middle of the battlefield. And it was one of those hills that a battle and ultimately the Civil War may have been won. A group from Maine led by Chamberlain and a small little group from Michigan, one of the smallest battalions in the army, gathered at the top of a, a hill they called Little Round Top to defend it from the charging armies from Alabama and Texas. The northern forces withstood two charges, but they realized they were running low on ammo and couldn't survive a third attack and they barely had space to retreat. And so while the group from Michigan, that small battalion, stood there face to face with the enemy, it was that group from Maine, led by Chamberlain, who made the decision to attach bayonets. You know what a bayonet is, don't you? It's a spike that you put on the end of your rifle to turn it into a really long sword. You don't fire with it because of the spread of the bullets. You don't fire with a bayonet on. This is your last chance effort. This is your last chance. You're going to run down with everything you got, and while you're getting shot at, you're hoping to take down one or two more people, disrupt the enemy enough. They were giving their lives. And wouldn't you know, the way they set up, they swept around from the side, they attacked from the flank while those Michiganders stood there. Go Michigan. While those Michiganders stood there, they swept in from the side and caused enough disruption with those spikes, took out just enough people with those spikes that the Union was able to hold off disrupt the South, mess up the whole game plan, and at some point down the road actually won the war. The Civil War, of course, didn't end in 1863 at the close of Gettysburg, but this decisive battle swung the momentum and made it just a matter of time. The cross didn't end that great cosmic Civil War. It's still going on, but at the cross... We've now been shown once and for all who the enemy is, what he stands for, and the fact that he is now a defeated foe. The cross continues to be the key to understanding all that we stand for in our faith. But why would he go through that when we've sinned so many times? The cross is not so much about our sins, but about his love. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It was not because of our sins primarily that God was doing it just because he had to. It was an unconditional love for us that took him. And Jesus took those spikes. Once again, those spikes came out Maybe for a group of Michiganders. While well, we're standing here, we're fighting against the army. The lesson for today is a reminder that everything we face, our troubles, our trials, the persecutions, the whole great controversy, the ups and the downs, yeah, even our own sinful mistakes, it's all taken care of because of the cross and Christ's love for you. My appeal to you is to leave here at peace knowing that no matter how badly you've messed up in the past, the cross has taken care of it all. And to help cement that in place, I want you to sing a simple song. You heard a portion of it during our, our uh, children's story. This is our, our usual call to the children. I want you to sing a simple song. I want you to put that simple, catchy tune into your heart that you might be able to hum it throughout the day and to remember that Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Do you see anything in there through all of your sinfulness? Is there any reminder that, you know, Jesus loves me when I do what I'm supposed to do? Jesus is kind of fond of me every once in a while, like when I go to church or pay tithe or keep the Sabbath or any of those other things. Yeah, he likes it when we do that. But he loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's it. That's the, end. That, that's the whole sum of the line. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to invite the choristers forward. I want you to sing with me. I want you to stand with me. We're going to sing this song in sections. I'm going to talk to you between each of the verses. We're going to make one step at a time.
And so I want the choristers to come forward as we sing. So I'm reminded of a story from a man named Karl Barth. Karl Barth is one of the greatest historians of the or greatest theologians of the 20th century. He went to the University of Chicago once, and they asked him, Dr. Barth, in all of your studies of theology, studying the Bible and studying all of this stuff, do you have one central phrase that you stand that, that summarizes everything that you've learned? He said, Absolutely, I do. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, is what he replied to that group of philosophers and professors. And so when I talk to you about your theology, when I talk to you about everything that you stand for and everything you believe, the number one question that I want to ask you in this appeal is do you believe that Jesus Christ's love for you rides above all of those other issues, everything in your theology? Do you want to make it all about Jesus and his love for you? If so, I'd like you to raise your hand. Amen. Let's sing our second verse. to those who have been reminded that he died to open heaven gates wide for you and for me to wash away my sins and so for some of you I'm speaking to those who have not been baptized who have made a decision that they want to connect to Jesus and they want to give their life to him through baptism some of you have already made this decision either at camp or or in a series if you have made the decision for baptism either publicly or you want to do it right now for the first time I want you to come forward it, for the little ones out there, or maybe the grown-ups who have been wrestling in their relationship with God, those who want to possibly consider rebaptism, I want you to just slide on out and come forward as we talk about Jesus is the one who will wash away my sins. Let this little child come into those open gates. I see one here. Amen. Praise the Lord. I know that there are others that you are still wrestling with these decisions. I've already done Bible studies with a few of you. And for those of you who are still wrestling with the decision whether or not you want to be washed from your sins, I want you to wrestle with it for just another minute. We're going to sing another chorus, and we'll give you another opportunity here. We're going to sing the third verse. just another chance. Those of you who have been wrestling, who haven't been baptized, this is your chance, the one who will wash away your sins. This is your chance to come forward. Like it says, take my heart. Take this heart of mine. Make it pure and holy thine. If you want to make that decision for baptism, for rebaptism, 
I'd like you to come forward. To the rest of you, this is a reminder. We've had the opportunity day by day to be reminded to take my heart, make it pure and wholly thine. This is something that you can do on a day by day. This is a chance to recommit to Jesus, to tell him every single day, take my heart, make it pure and wholly thine. On the cross you died for me. I will love and live for thee. If that's what you want to say, God, take my heart. You washed away my sin. Now let me live for you. I'd like you to raise your hands. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Through all of the theology and everything we've learned, the reminder once again that the heart of everything is the fact that we can be made new creations because of the death of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We do have the opportunity to walk out of here free from, the, from our past, to walk out of here to keep our eyes focused on the future, and to know that today and in the present, we can go forward because Jesus loves me. And so, Lord, I ask for your, your blessing to be upon these people. Help them to draw closer to you through everything. Lord, help them to know without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus loves them. I pray for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.